fellow Americans, I come before you tonight as a candidate for the vice presidency and as a man whose honesty and, t and integrity has been questioned. Now, the usual political thing to do when charges are made against you is to either ignore them or to deny them without giving details. I believe we've had enough of that in the United States, particularly with the present administration in Washington, D.C. To me, the office of the Vice Presidency of the United States is a great office. And I feel that the people have got to have confidence in the integrity of the men who run for that office and who might obtain it. I have a theory, too, that the best and only answer to a smear or to an honest misunderstanding of the facts is to tell the truth. And that's why I'm here tonight. I want to tell you my side of the case. I'm sure that you have read the charge and you've heard it. That I, Senator Nixon, took $18,000 from a group of my supporters. Now, was that wrong? And let me say that it was wrong. I'm saying, incidentally, that it was wrong, not just illegal, because it isn't a question of whether it was legal or illegal. That isn't enough. The question is, was it morally wrong? I say that it was morally wrong if any of that $18,000 went to Senator Nixon for my personal use. I say that it was morally wrong if it was secretly given and secretly handled. And I say that it was morally wrong if any of the contributors got special favors for the contributions that they made. And now to answer those questions, let me say this. Not one cent of the $18,000 or any other money of that type ever went to me for my personal use. Every penny of it was used to pay for political expenses that I did not think should be charged to the taxpayers of the United States. It was not a secret fund. As a matter of fact, when I was on Meet the Press, some of you may have seen it last Sunday, Peter Edson came up to me after the program and he said, Dick, what about this fund we hear about? And I said, well, there's no secret about it. Go out and see Dana Smith, who was the administrator of the fund. And I gave him his address. And I said, you will find that the purpose of the fund simply was to defray political expenses that I did not feel should be charged to the government. And third, let me point out, and I want to make this particularly clear, that no contributor to this fund, no contributor to any of my campaigns has ever received any consideration that he would not have received as an ordinary constituent. I just don't believe in that. And I can say that never while I have been in the Senate of the United States, as far as the people that contributed to this fund of concern, have I made a telephone call for them to an agency? Or have I gone down to an agency in their behalf? And the records will show that. The records which are in the hands of the administration. Well, then some of you will say, and rightly, well, what did you use the fund for, Senator? Why did you have to have it? Let me tell you in just a word how a Senate office operates. First of all, a senator gets $15,000 a year in salary. He gets enough money to pay for one trip a year, a round trip that is, for himself and his family between his home and Washington, D.C. And then he gets an allowance to handle the people that work in his office, to handle his mail. And the allowance for my state of California is enough to hire 13 people. And let me say, incidentally, that that allowance is not paid to the senator. It's paid directly to the individuals that the senator puts on his payroll. But all of these people and all of these allowances are for strictly official business. Business, for example, when a constituent writes in and wants you to go down to the Veterans Administration and get some information about his GI policy, items of that type, for example. But there are other expenses which are not covered by the government. 
And I think I can best discuss those expenses by asking you some questions. Do you think that when I or any other senator makes a political speech, has it printed, should charge the printing of that speech and the mailing of that speech to the taxpayers? Do you think, for example, when I or any other senator makes a trip to his home state to make a purely political speech, that the cost of that trip should be charged to the taxpayers? Do you think when a senator makes political broadcasts or political television broadcasts, radio or television, that the expense of those broadcasts should be charged to the taxpayers? Well, I know what your answer is. It's the same answer that audiences give me whenever I discuss this particular problem. The answer is no. The taxpayer shouldn't be required to finance items which are not official business, but which are primarily political business. Well, then the question arises, you say, well, how do you pay for these and how can you do it legally? And there are several ways that it can be done, incidentally, and that it is done legally in the United States Senate and in the Congress. The first way is to be a rich man. I don't happen to be a rich man, so I couldn't use that way. Another way that is used is to put your wife on the payroll. Let me say, incidentally, that my opponent, my opposite number for the vice presidency of the Democratic ticket, does have his wife on the payroll and has had it, her on his payroll, for the 10 years, for the past 10 years. Now, just let me say this. That's his business, and I'm not critical of him for doing that. You will have to pass judgment on that particular point. But I have never done that for this reason. I have found that there are so many deserving stenographers and secretaries in Washington that needed the work that I just didn't feel it was right to put my wife in the payroll. My wife's sitting over here. She's a wonderful stenographer. She used to teach stenography and she used to teach shorthand in high school. That was when I met her. And I can tell you folks that she's worked many hours at night and many hours on Saturdays and Sundays in my office. And she's done a fine job. And I'm proud to say tonight that in the six years I've been in the House and the Senate of the United States, Pat Nixon has never been on the government payroll. Well, there are other ways that these finances can be taken care of. Some who are lawyers, and I happen to be a lawyer, continue to practice law. But I haven't been able to do that. I'm so far away from California that I've been so busy with my senatorial work that I have not engaged in any legal practice. And also, as far as law practice was concerned, it seemed to me that the relationship between an attorney and a client was so personal that you couldn't possibly represent a man as an attorney and then have an unbiased view when he presented his case to you in the event that he had one before the government. And so I felt that the best way to handle these necessary political expenses of getting my message to the American people and the speeches I made, the speeches that I had printed for the most part, concerned this one message of exposing this administration, the communism in it, the corruption in it. The only way that I could do that was to accept the aid which people in my home state of California who contributed to my campaign and who continued to make these contributions after I was elected were glad to make. And let me say I'm proud of the fact that not one of them has ever asked me for a special favor. I'm proud of the fact that not one of them has ever asked me to vote on a bill other than in my own conscience would dictate. And I'm proud of the fact that the taxpayers, by subterfuge or otherwise, have never paid one dime for expenses which I thought were political and shouldn't be charged to the taxpayers. Let me say, incidentally, that some of you may say, well, that's all right, Senator. That's your explanation. But have you got any proof? And I'd like to tell you this evening that just an hour ago, we received an independent audit of this entire fund. 
I suggested to Governor Sherman Adams, who is the chief of staff of the Dwight Eisenhower campaign, that an independent audit and legal report be obtained. And I have that audit here in my hands. It's an audit made by the Price Waterhouse and Company firm and the legal opinion by Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, lawyers in Los Angeles, the biggest law firm and incidentally, one of the best ones in Los Angeles. I'm proud to be able to report to you tonight that this audit and this legal opinion is being forwarded to General Eisenhower. And I'd like to read to you the opinion that was prepared by Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher and based on all the pertinent laws and statutes, together with the audit report prepared by the certified public accountants. Quote, it is our conclusion that Senator Nixon did not obtain any financial gain from the collection and disbursement of the fund by Dana Smith. That Senator Nixon did not violate any federal or state law by reason of the operation of the fund and that neither the portion of the fund paid by Dana Smith directly to third persons, nor the portion paid to Senator Nixon to reimburse him for designated office expenses constituted income to the Senator, which was either reportable or taxable as income under applicable tax laws. Signed, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher by Elmo H. Conway. Now that, my friends, is not Nixon speaking. But that's an independent audit which was requested because I want the American people to know all the facts and I'm not afraid of having independent people go in and check the facts. And that is exactly what they did. But then I realized that there are still some who may say, and rightfully so, and let me say that I recognize that some will continue to smear regardless of what the truth may be, but that there has been understandably some honest misunderstanding on this matter. And there's some that will say, well, maybe you were able, Senator, to fake this thing. How can we believe what you say? After all, is there a possibility that maybe you got some sums in cash? Is there a possibility that you may have feathered your own nest? And so now what I am going to do and incidentally, this is unprecedented in the history of American politics. I am going at this time to give to this television and radio audience a complete financial history. Everything I've earned, everything I've spent, everything I owe. And I want you to know the facts. I have to start early. I was born in 1913. Our family was one of modest circumstances and most of my early life was spent in a store out in East Whittier. It was a grocery store, one of those family enterprises. The only reason we were able to make it go was because my mother and dad had five boys and we all worked in the store. I worked my way through college and to a great extent through law school. And then, in 1940, probably the best thing that ever happened to me happened. I married Pat, who's sitting over here. We had a rather difficult time after we were married, like so many of the young couples who may be listening to us. I practiced law. She continued to teach school. Then in 1942, I went into the service. Let me say that my service record was not a particularly unusual one. I went to the South Pacific. I guess I'm entitled to a couple of battle stars. I got a couple of letters of commendation, but I was just there when the bombs were falling. And then I returned. Returned to the United States, and in 1946, I ran for the Congress. When we came out of the war, Pat and I, Pat, during the war, had worked as a stenographer and in a bank and as an economist for a government agency. And when we came out, the total of our savings from both my law practice, her teaching, and all the time that I was in the war, the total for that entire period was just a little less than $10,000. Every cent of that, incidentally, was in government bonds. Well, that's where we start when I go into politics. Now, what have I earned since I went into politics? Well, here it is. I've jotted it down. Let me read the notes. 
First of all, I've had my salary as a congressman and as a senator. Second, I have received a total in this past six years of $1,600 from estates which were in my law firm at the time that I severed my connection with it. And incidentally, as I said before, I have not engaged in any legal practice and have not accepted any fees from business that came into the firm after I went into politics. I have made an average of approximately $1,500 a year from non-political speaking engagements and lectures. And then fortunately, we've inherited a little money. Pat sold her interest in her father's estate for $3,000, and I inherited $1,500 from my grandfather. We lived rather modestly. For four years, we lived in an apartment in Park Fairfax in Alexandria, Virginia. The rent was $80 a month. And we saved for the time that we could buy a house. Now, that was what we took in. What did we do with this money? What do we have today to show for it? This will surprise you because it is so little, I suppose, as standards generally go of people in public life. First of all, we've got a house in Washington which cost $41,000 and in which we owe $20,000. We have a house in Whittier, California, which cost $13,000 and on which we owe $3,000. My folks are living there at the present time. I have just $4,000 in life insurance, plus my GI policy, which I've never been able to convert and which will run out in two years. I have no life insurance whatever on Pat. I have no life insurance on our two youngsters, Tricia and Julie. I own a 1950 Oldsmobile car. We have our furniture. We have no stocks and bonds of any type. We have no interest of any kind, direct or any indirect, in any business. Now, that's what we have. What do we owe? Well, in addition to the mortgage, the $20,000 mortgage on the house in Washington, the $10,000 one on the house in Whittier, I owe $4,500 to the Riggs Bank in Washington, D.C., with interest at 4.5%. I owe $3,500 to my parents, and the interest on that loan, which I pay regularly, because it's the part of the savings they made through the years they were working so hard, I pay regularly 4% interest. And then I have a $500 loan, which I have on my life insurance. Well, that's about it. That's what we have, and that's what we owe. It isn't very much, but Pat and I have the satisfaction that every dime that we've got is honestly ours. I should say this, that Pat doesn't have a mink coat, but she does have a respectable Republican cloth coat, and I always tell her that she'd look good in anything. One other thing I probably should tell you, because if I don't, they'll probably be saying this about me too. We did get something, a gift, after the election. A man down in Texas heard Pat in the radio mention the fact that our two youngsters would like to have a dog. And believe it or not, the day before we left on this campaign trip, we got a message from the Union Station in Baltimore saying they had a package for us. We went down to get it. You know what it was? It was a little cocker spaniel dog in a crate that he'd sent all the way from Texas. Black and white, spotted. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Checkers. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're gonna keep it. It isn't easy to come before a nationwide audience and bear your life as I've done. But I want to say some things before I conclude that I think most of you will agree on. Mr. Mitchell, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, made the statement 
that if a man couldn't afford to be in the United States Senate, he shouldn't run for the Senate. And I just want to make my position clear. I don't agree with Mr. Mitchell when he says that only a rich man should serve his government in the United States Senate or in the Congress. I don't believe that represents the thinking of the Democratic Party, and I know that it doesn't represent the thinking of the Republican Party. I believe that it's fine that a man like Governor Stevenson, who inherited a fortune from his father, can run for president. But I also feel that it's essential in this country of ours that a man of modest means can also run for president. Because, you know, remember Abraham Lincoln, you remember what he said. God must have loved the common people. He made so many of them. And now I'm going to suggest some courses of conduct. First of all, you have read in the papers about other funds now. Mr. Stevenson apparently had a couple. One of them in which a group of business people paid and helped to supplement the salaries of state employees. Here is where the money went directly into their pockets. And I think that what Mr. Stevenson should do should be to come before the American people as I have. Give the names of the people that contributed to that fund. Give the names of the people who put this money into their pockets at the same time that they were receiving money from their state government. And see what favors, if any, they gave out for that. I don't condemn Mr. Stevenson for what he did, but until the facts are in, there is a doubt that will be raised. And as far as Mr. Sparkman is concerned, I would suggest the same thing. He's had his wife in the payroll. I don't condemn him for that. But I think that he should come before the American people and indicate what outside sources of income he has had. I would suggest that under the circumstances, both Mr. Sparkman and Mr. Stevenson should come before the American people as I have and make a complete financial statement as to their financial history. And if they don't, it will be an admission that they have something to hide. And I think you will agree with me. Because folks, remember, a man that's to be president of the United States, a man that's to be vice president of the United States, must have the confidence of all the people. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's why I suggest that Mr. Stevenson and Mr. Sparkman, since they are under attack, should do what they're doing. Now, let me say this. I know that this is not the last of the smears. In spite of my explanation tonight, other smears will be made. Others have been made in the past. And the purpose of the smears, I know, is this. To silence me. To make me let up. Well, they just don't know who they're dealing with. I'm going to tell you this. I remember in the dark days of the Hiss case, some of the same columnists, some of the same radio commentators who are attacking me now and misrepresenting my position were violently opposing me at the time I was after Alger Hiss. But I continued to fight because I knew I was right. And I can say to this great television and radio audience that I have no apologies to the American people for my part in putting Alger Hiss where he is today. And as far as this is concerned, I intend to continue to fight. Why do I feel so deeply? Why do I feel that in spite of the smears, the misunderstanding, the necessity for a man to come up here and bear his soul as I have, why is it necessary for me to continue this fight? And I want to tell you why. Because you see, I love my country. And I think my country is in danger. And I think the only man that can save America at this time is the man that's running for president on my ticket, Dwight Eisenhower. You say, why do I think it's in danger? And I say, look at the record. Seven years of the Truman Atchison administration and what's happened. 600 million people lost to the communists. And a war in Korea in which we have lost 117,000 American casualties. And I say to all of you that a policy that results in a loss of 600 million people to the communists and a war which cost us 117,000 American casualties isn't good enough for America. And I say that those in the State Department that made the mistake 
mistakes which caused that war and which resulted in those losses should be kicked out of the State Department just as fast as we get them out of there. And let me say that I know Mr. Stevenson won't do that because he defends the Truman policy. And I know that Dwight Eisenhower will do that and that he will give America the leadership that it needs. Take the problem of corruption. You read about the mess in Washington. Mr. Stevenson can't clean it up because he was picked by the man, Truman, under whose administration the mess was made. You wouldn't trust the man who made the mess to clean it up, that's Truman. And by the same token, you can't trust the man who was picked by the man that made the mess to clean it up, and that's Stevenson. And so I say, Eisenhower, who owes nothing to Truman, nothing to the big city bosses, he is the man that can clean up the mess in Washington. Take communism. I say that as far as that subject is concerned, the danger is great to America. In the Hiss case, they got the secrets, which enabled them to break the American secret State Department code. They got secrets in the atomic bomb case, which enabled them to get the secret of the atomic bomb five years before they would have gotten it by their own devices. And I say that any man who called the Alger Hiss case a red herring isn't fit to be president of the United States. I say that a man who, like Mr. Stevenson, has poo-pooed and ridiculed the communist threat in the United States, he said that they are phantoms among ourselves. He has accused us that have attempted to expose the communists of looking for communists in the Bureau of Fisheries and Wildlife. I say that a man who says that isn't qualified to be president of the United States. And I say that the only man who can lead us in this fight to rid the government of both those who are communists and those who have corrupted this government is Eisenhower. Because Eisenhower, you can be sure, recognizes the problem and he knows how to deal with it. Now let me say that finally this evening, I want to read to you just briefly excerpts from a letter which I received. A letter which, after all this is over, no one can take away from us. It reads as follows. Dear Senator Nixon, since I'm only 19 years of age, I can't vote in this presidential election, but believe me if I could, you and General Eisenhower would certainly get my vote. My husband is in the Fleet Marines in Korea. He's a carman on the front lines, and we have a two-month-old son. He's never seen. And I feel confident that with great Americans like you and General Eisenhower in the White House, lonely Americans like myself will be united with their loved ones now in Korea. I only pray to God that you won't be too late. Enclosed is a small check to help you in your campaign. Living on $85 a month, it is all I can afford at present, but let me know what else I can do. Folks, it's a check for $10, and it's one that I will never cash. And just let me say this. We hear a lot about prosperity these days, but I say, why can't we have prosperity built on peace rather than prosperity built on war? Why can't we have prosperity and an honest government in Washington, D.C. at the same time? Believe me, we can. And Eisenhower is the man that can lead this crusade to bring us that kind of prosperity. And now, finally, I know that you wonder whether or not I am going to stay on the Republican ticket or resign. Let me say this. I don't believe that I ought to quit because I'm not a quitter. And incidentally, Pat's not a quitter. After all, her name was Patricia Ryan and she was born on St. Patrick's Day and you know the Irish never quit. But the decision, my friends, is not mine. I would do nothing that would harm the possibilities of Dwight Eisenhower to become president of the United States. And for that reason, I am submitting to the Republican National Committee tonight through this television broadcast the decision which it is theirs to make. Let them decide whether my position on the ticket will help or hurt. And I'm going to ask you to help them decide. Wire and write the Republican National Committee whether you think I should stay on or whether I should get off. And whatever their decision is, I will abide by it. 
but just let me say this last word. Regardless of what happens, I'm going to continue this fight. I'm going to campaign up and down in America until we drive the crooks and the communists and those that defend them out of Washington. And remember, folks, Eisenhower is a great man, believe me. A retreat of the, from the United States from Vietnam would be a communist victory, a victory of massive proportions and would lead to World War III. Let me tell you what those four years have done to America. The longest war that America's ever had in its history. The worst crime wave we've ever had in our history. The highest taxes we've ever had in our history. The highest rate in the cost of living that we've had in a generation. And the lowest respect for the United States of America in our history. And so tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I have initiated a plan of action which will enable me to keep that pledge. The more support I can have from the American people, the sooner that pledge can be redeemed. For the more divided we are at home, the less likely the enemy is to negotiate at Paris. Let us be united for peace. Let us also be united against defeat. Because let us understand, North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office where so many decisions have been made that shape the history of this nation. Each time I have done so to discuss with you some matter that I believe affected the national interest. In all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere, to make every possible effort to complete the term of office to which you elected. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. As long as there was such a base, I felt strongly that it was necessary to see the constitutional process through to its conclusion, that to do otherwise would be unfaithful to the spirit of that deliberately difficult process and a dangerously destabilizing precedent for the future. But with the disappearance of that base, I now believe that the constitutional purpose has been served and there is no longer a need for the process to be the law. I would have preferred to carry through to the finish whatever the personal agony it would have involved. And my family unanimously urged me to do so. But the interests of a nation must always come before any personal considerations. From the discussions I have had with congressional and other leaders, I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of the Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation will require. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress, particularly at this time with problems we face at home and abroad. To continue the fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost 
almost totally absorbed the time and attention of both the President and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. As I recall the high hopes for America with which we began this second term, I feel a great sadness that I will not be here in this office working on your behalf to achieve those hopes in the next two and a half years. But in turning over the direction of the government to Vice President Ford, I know, as I told the nation when I nominated him for that office 10 months ago, that the leadership of America will be in good hands. In passing this office to the Vice President, I also do so with a profound sense of the weight of responsibility that will fall on his shoulders tomorrow and therefore of the understanding, the patience, the cooperation he will need from all Americans. As he assumes that responsibility, he will deserve the help and the support of all of us. As we look to the future, the first essential is to begin healing the wounds of this nation put the bitterness and divisions of the recent past behind us, and to rediscover those shared ideals that lie at the heart of our strength and unity as a great and as a free people. By taking this action, I hope that I will have hastened the start of that process of healing which is so desperately needed in America. I regret deeply any injuries that may have been done in the course of the events that led to this decision. I would say only that if some of my judgments were wrong, and some were wrong, they were made in what I believed at the time to be the best interest of the nation. who have stood with me during these past difficult months, to my family, my friends, to many others who joined in supporting my cause because they believe it was right. I will be eternally grateful for your support. And to those who have not felt able Give me your support. Let me say, I leave with no bitterness toward those who have opposed me. Because all of us in the final analysis have been concerned with the good of the country, however our judgments might differ. So let us all now join together in affirming that common commitment and in helping our new president succeed for the benefit of all Americans. I shall leave this office with regret at not completing my term, but with gratitude for the privilege of serving as your president for the past five and a half years. These years have been a momentous time in the history of our nation and the world. They have been a time of achievement in which we can all be proud. Achievements that represent the shared efforts of the administration, the Congress, and the people. But the challenges ahead are equally great. And they, too, will require the support and the efforts of the Congress and the people working in cooperation with the new administration. We have ended America's longest war. But in the work of securing a lasting peace in the world, the goals ahead are even more far-reaching and more difficult. We must complete a structure of peace 
so that it will be said of this generation, our generation of Americans, by the people of all nations, not only that we ended one war, but that we prevented future wars. We have unlocked the doors that for a quarter of a century stood between the United States and the People's Republic of China. We must now ensure that the one quarter of the world's people who live in the People's Republic of China will be and remain not our enemies, but our friends. In the Middle East, 100 million people in the Arab countries, many of whom have considered us their enemy for nearly 20 years, now look on us as their friends. We must continue to build on that friendship so that peace can settle at last over the Middle East and so that the cradle of civilization will not become its grave. Together with the Soviet Union, we have made the crucial breakthroughs that have begun the process of limiting nuclear arms. But we must set as our goal not just limiting, but reducing and finally destroying these terrible weapons so that they cannot destroy civilization. And so that the threat of nuclear war will no longer hang over the world and the people. We have opened a new relation with the Soviet Union. We must continue to develop and expand that new relationship so that the two strongest nations of the world will live together in cooperation rather than confrontation. Around the world, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Middle East, there are millions of people who live in terror of poverty, even starvation. We must keep as our goal turning away from production for war and expanding production for peace so that people everywhere on this earth can at last look forward in their children's time, if not in our own time, to having the necessities for a decent life. Here in America, we are fortunate that most of our people have not only the blessings of liberty, but also the means to live full and good, and by the world's standards, even abundant lives. We must press on, however, toward a goal not only of more and better jobs, but a full opportunity for every American. And of what we are striving so hard right now to achieve, prosperity without inflation. century in public life, I have shared in the turbulent history of this era. I have fought for what I believe in. I have tried, to the best of my ability, to discharge those duties and meet those responsibilities that were entrusted to me. Sometimes I have succeeded, and sometimes I have failed. heart from what Theodore Roosevelt once said about the man in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again because there is not effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deed, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumphs of high achievements, and who is the worst, if he fails, at least fails greatly. At 
pledge to you tonight that as long as I have a breath of life in my body, I shall continue in that spirit. I shall continue to work for the great causes to which I have been dedicated throughout my years as a congressman, a senator, a vice president, and president. The cause of peace, not just for America, but among all nations. Prosperity, justice, and opportunity for all of our people. There is one cause, above all, to which I have been devoted, and to which I shall always be devoted for as long as I live. When I first took the oath of office as president five and a half years ago, I made this sacred commitment to consecrate my office, my energies, and all the wisdom I can summon to the cause of peace among nations. I've done my very best in all the days since to be true to that pledge. As a result of these efforts, I am confident that the world is a safer place today, not only for the people of America, but for the people of all nations. And that all of our children have a better chance than before of living in peace rather than dying in war. This, more than anything, is what I hoped to achieve when I sought the presidency. This, more than anything, is what I hope will be my legacy to you, to our country, as I leave the presidency. To serve in this office, it's to have felt a very personal sense of kinship with each and every American. In leaving it, I do so with this prayer. May God's grace be with you in all the days ahead. for this radio and television time tonight for the purpose of announcing that we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. The following statement is being issued at this moment in Washington and Hanoi. At 12.30 Paris time today, January 23, 1973, the agreement on ending the war and restoring peace in Vietnam was initialed by Dr. Henry Kissinger on behalf of the United States and Special Advisor Lee Duc Tho on behalf of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The agreement will be formally signed by the parties participating in the Paris Conference on Vietnam on January 27, 1973 at the International Conference Center in Paris. The ceasefire will take effect at 2400 Greenwich Mean Time, January 27, 1973. The United States and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam express the hope that this agreement will ensure stable peace in Vietnam and contribute to the preservation of lasting peace in Indochina and Southeast Asia. That concludes the formal statement. Throughout the years of negotiations, we have insisted on peace with honor. In my addresses to the nation from this room of January 25th and May 8th, I set forth the goals that we considered essential for peace with honor. In the settlement that has now been agreed to, all the conditions that I laid down then have been met. A ceasefire, internationally supervised, will begin at 7 p.m. this Saturday, January 27, Washington time. Within 60 days from this Saturday, all Americans held prisoners of war throughout Indochina will be released. There will be the fullest possible accounting for all of those who are missing in action. During the same 60-day period, all American forces will be withdrawn from South Vietnam. The people of South Vietnam have been guaranteed the right to determine their own future without outside interference. 
joint agreement. The full text of the agreement and the protocols to carry it out will be issued tomorrow. Throughout these negotiations, we have been in the closest consultation with President Chu and other representatives of the Republic of Vietnam. This settlement meets the goals and has the full support of President Chu and the government of the Republic of Vietnam, as well as that of our other allies who are affected. The United States will continue to recognize the government of the Republic of Vietnam as the sole legitimate government of South Vietnam. We shall continue to aid South Vietnam within the terms of the agreement, and we shall support efforts by the people of South Vietnam to settle their problems peacefully among themselves. We must recognize that ending the war is only the first step toward building the peace. All parties must now see to it that this is a peace that lasts, and also a peace that heals and a peace that not only ends the war in Southeast Asia, but contributes to the prospects of peace in the whole world. Gentlemen of the conference, the United States welcomes you with unselfish hands. We harbor no fears. We have no sordid ends to serve. We suspect no enemy. We contemplate or apprehend no conquest. Content with what we have, we seek nothing which is another's. I can speak officially only for our United States. Our hundred million, frankly, want less of armaments and none of war. My fellow citizens, recent events have imposed upon the patriotic people of this country a responsibility and a duty greater than that of any since the Civil War. Then it was a struggle to preserve the government of the United States. Now it is a struggle to preserve the financial honor of the government. I am a great lover of humor, however little I have of it, and believe in it as a panacea. In these days of nervous prostration, of brain fag, and of the strenuous life, there is nothing that so much contributes to a survival of the trials and sufferings of the day as a sense of humor. It is like the puffers in the solid train, like the air cushion of a modern field gun. It saves the joke. In order to induce their employer into a compliance with their request for changed terms of employment, Workmen have the right to strike in a body. To use such persuasion as they may, provided it does not reach the point of duress, to lead their reluctant co-laborers to join them in their union against their employer. What they have not the right to do is to injure their employer's property, to injure their employer's business by use of threats or methods of physical duress against those who would work for it, or by carrying on what is sometimes known as a secondary boycott against his customers. Mr. General Secretary, I think you understand that we're not just grateful to both you and Mrs. Gorbachev, but I want you to know we think of you as friends. My fellow Americans, I'm pleased to tell you today that I've signed legislation that will outlaw Russia forever. We begin bombing in five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm only going to talk to you just for a minute or so this evening because I have some very sad news for all of you and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King uh, was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are 
in what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country in greater polarization. Black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand compassion and love. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and distrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poem, my, my favorite poet was Aeschylus. And he once wrote, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. So I ask you tonight, to return home, to say a prayer for the family, Martin Luther King, yeah, that's true, but more importantly, to say a prayer for our own country, which all of us love, a prayer for understanding and that compassion of which I spoke. We can do well in this country. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past but we will, end, we will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. It is not the end of lawlessness. And it's not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to improve the quality of our life and want justice for all human beings that abide in our land. And what dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Thank you very much.
the efforts that you made on his behalf for his election in November of 1960. And perhaps most importantly, the encouragement and the strength that you gave him after he was elected president of the United States. Oh, 